Nobody ever watched Gandhi. They said they watched Gandhi. They also said they watched The English Patient. 1982 was my favorite year for movies, and it all started with a little space opera you might have heard of called Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. And that's 40 years old in just a couple of weeks here. And that just makes me think that galloping around the galaxy is a job for the young. Hey, everybody. I'm Steve <laughs> Green with Bill Whittle and Scott Welcome. Ott. And this is Right Angle, brought to you by the members of BillWhittle.com. And hey, before we get to the, 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 the good stuff here, click that like button, that alert button, that five star button, that thumbs up button, whatever it does that lets other people know that you like this stuff. It helps us and it costs you nothing. So, uh, Thanks. All right, uh, gentlemen. Actually, Bill, I just got to go right to you for this one. We're, we're, sure. both, we're, we're both huge uh, Star Trek fans. It never got any better than Wrath no. of Khan as far as I'm concerned. And rewatching that movie, as I do probably more times than I want to admit to an audience this size, um, I've just – this isn't even cranky old man. This is This is a legitimate gripe. That storytelling has just gone downhill since 1982, which I consider to be the greatest year for movies ever. And I'm going to get deeper into that here in, in just a couple of minutes. But when you watch all of these woke movies that are more concerned with uh, lecturing us and setting uh, good examples for us and, and all the rest, does, does it make you laugh at the superior intellect? <laughs> It's coming through now, Con. Um, <laughs> the uh, yeah. Well, first of all, they just premiered Strange New Worlds, which is the latest attempt to 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 hold Star Trek's coat while it molests your child. You know, it, it's just it's just appallingly awful. Um, but but you're right. Wrath of Khan wasn't just as good as Star Trek got. And Wrath of Khan wasn't just a good Star Trek movie. It was a good sci-fi movie. As a matter of fact, it's just a good movie. It's a great yeah. movie. Uh, and it was a great movie for all the classic reasons. It was a great movie because you had this clash of titans. You know, it really was. It was you've got a villain who's quoting, you know, Melville. Uh, you've got this epic, epic confrontation. You've got you got great special effects. Of phasers never look better than they did in that episode. Yeah. The Enterprise never looked better than it did in, in that movie. Uh, I remember I, I saw that movie in when I was in college, and a, a bunch of friends of mine went to the show right before me, and we were standing outside the theater waiting to get in. They came out, and I said, "Is it Star Trek?" And they said, "Oh, is it ever Star? Is it Star? Yes." It's, <laughs> uh, uh, first time they come out yeah. those they come out in those <laughs> burgundy uniforms, you know, and just go, oh. So. Putting all the geekery aside, it's just a, it's just a really great great story. It's a it's a really well told story, and and I think it bears mentioning, Steve, that the reason that that was such a good story, and the reason that Star Trek, well, the reason the Gorn is sitting in the, the back of the room there with his with his sharpened flint blade while I while I construct my bamboo cannon, you know, uh, is that is that. They they understood that the essence to drama is is to have is to give your hero some place to go. The problem with um, with the with the woke uh, agenda is that they're so super sensitive that that they're all Mary Sue characters. A Mary Sue character is a character who can do anything better than anybody. So, in for instance, with with um, the new Star Wars trilogy trilogy, you've got um, Ray, who's a a woman, and because she's a woman, she can. Uh, outdo the evil uh, the evil villain in a lightsaber, even though she's never picked one up before. She flies the Millennium Falcon better than than Han Solo did after 25 years. She's never been on board a spaceship before. She can do everything perfectly all the time because she's the hero, you see, and that's what you want from heroes. No, that's not what you want from heroes. You want heroes to be flawed, and you want them to overcome their flaws, and you want them to become better people at the end of the movie than they were at the beginning. Yeah. It's called a character arc, and that's the essence of drama. And the reason that that Wrath of Khan is is such a good movie, and Kirk is at his absolute best in that movie, is because Kirk is also at his absolute lowest in that movie, and that's why that movie works. Um, I I generally try to avoid dropping names as often as I could, but in this case, I can't resist the temptation. Um, I was sitting having lunch with with John Voight, who's just a great guy. And we were talking about acting, and John's a, a brilliant actor. And and the reason Wrath of Khan is 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 so good, in my opinion, is because 
in Ricardo Montalban, they finally found somebody who was hammy enough to, to balance William Shatner. <laughs> and, you, and, it, and, and it allowed you to turn the whole thing up to 11, but keep it consistent. And I'm not joking about this. Yeah. He, Shatner's a very, he's got a very broad style. And, and Montalban is, is, a, is, is a rich Corinthian. Both of them are kind of <laughs> cartoons almost, but, but they're very good at, at, the, at that particular kind of cartoon. And when, you, and when you give Kirk somebody who's acting on that kind of, you know, almost like grand level, you, you you really get a balance out of it. And the reason I dropped the name was I said, you know, that's a, both of those guys. Said, that's the thing, you know, John. That's the thing about William Shatner. You know, you you go see a movie Shatner's in, you pay seven fifty, but you get twenty dollars worth of acting. And he just started <laughs> crying, he started laughing. Sorry. But but that's really what it was. It was just it was just a. a it was just a damn good story, a story about friendship, and and it was a story about people that you knew and grew up with. At least I did, and everything worked. and And it was never better before that. It was never better after that. And um, as I think you're going to point out, as we learned from our backstage show, it wasn't just Ratha Khan that was uh, zooming in in '82, but that was one of my peak experiences. As a matter of fact, I, I watched a bunch of clips from it, not knowing about the the show just a couple of days ago. And, and I was in a movie theater watching this thing and they're in the Genesis cave and it looks like they're down and out. And it's a spoiler alert for 40 year old movie. <laughs> and it's like, Oh, you know, a guy Kirk's gotten his butt kicked. The enterprise is all shot to hell and they're stuck here in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, and they're sitting there waiting to die, you know? And then, uh, and then Kirk takes a bite out of that apple. And he's, you know, and he's just beat the Kobayashi Maru syndrome. And all of a sudden, the communicators, Mr. Spock, you ready to go? He says, I, Captain, we're we're ready to beam you aboard. And it's like, what, what? We're ready to beam you aboard? Yeah, and it's like all of a sudden everybody's there and he says, I don't like to lose. And people came out of their chairs, you know? They came out of their chairs just yeah. screaming. You can't get that kind of reaction unless you show that guy old, tired, worn out, glasses, old, feeling old. You don't get that triumph without that, without that uh, nadir. And, and that's why that was such a good Star Trek movie it was because it, it, it followed classical storytelling ideas more, more closely than anything they'd ever done. And, and brilliantly executed on the, on the filmmaking side too. I just, I watched a video uh, earlier today about why the initial space battle sequence in, in Star Trek II was so well done. I'm talking about when Khan launches a surprise attack mm -hmm. against the Enterprise under radio silence. We're all one big and happy fleet. They dissected that scene and somehow getting that scene dissected taught me to appreciate it even more because you realize just how hard the director and the editor and the guy who wrote the score all work together to to make that work. Um, Sorry to hog this one. I've, I've just got, oh, just, yeah, yeah, just, yeah. this is the same Scott. I wound him up. He's uh, got to go two, now. Just two things. There's a, there's a, there's an interview with the guy who did the music and I think it was, was it Goldsmith? I'm not sure. But, but basically if you, if you listen to that 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 first encounter, he's got the he's got Khan's theme, which is a da 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 da. -da -boom -boom. It's really kind of, and then the Enterprise is dun 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 dun, and and it's like first you hear the Khan theme, then the Enterprise are getting stronger, 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 stronger. You start her in wide shots, you get closer, 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 closer. That sequence is is a, a is a cinematography lesson in itself, and just for the fans out there, I had to point out uh, that. Uh, most Star Trek fans know this, but Ricardo Montalban and William Shatner were never in the same, never saw each other during the making of this movie. They were never on the same stage, never interacted. And Khan's you know, got these huge pecs. If you look at uh, Ricardo Montalban, he's got this uh, really tight, like almost like a choker necklace with a broken Starfleet uh, insignia on it. And uh, that's there because that's where the prosthetic chest of his uh, joined his actual head, his head with his rich Corinthian leather. Indeed. Um, Scott, 1982. I'm about to show you that it was the best year for movies ever. This is just a, a selection from the, the top 50 grossing movies of the year. Blade Runner, which is visually, whatever you think of the plot, the mo one of the most striking science fiction films of all brilliant, time. Brilliant film. The Thing, maybe the scariest movie of all time, and also possibly the best practical special effects of all time. Every every one of those transformations you see, they did live in front of a in front of a running camera. Just amazing. E.T. the Extraterrestrial, one of the best family movies of all time. First Blood 
the first Rambo movie, one of the great action movies of all time, and not because it had a ton of action, because it had a character you cared about. Uh, Poltergeist, one of the scariest movies of all time that isn't called The Thing. Um, <laughs> oh, and I found that now that I'm a dad, Poltergeist has gotten even scarier. It, it scared the crap out of me when I was when I was 13 years old. Now at 53 with kids of my own, oh, I, it, it, it brings tears out of me now. Um, Pink Floyd, The Wall, arguably the second greatest rock opera after the Who's Tommy. Tootsie, one of the great comedies of all time. Rocky III changed my world to see Rocky team up with Apollo Creed to beat Clubber Lang. Uh, Conan the Barbarian, they tried to remake that movie a few years ago. It was awful because you, you just can't do it without Arnold and you can't do it with any apologies, with any slightest nod to woke culture. Fast Times at Ridgemont High is not only laugh out loud funny, but it's one of the only movies that is true and real about teen sex and just how tragic it can be. Uh, the Verdict, one of the greatest, smartest dramas of all time. 48 Hours made Eddie Murphy a star. An officer and a gentleman. How long has it been since you saw a military drama where the military wasn't the bad guy and race wasn't an issue, even though the two lead actors were of different races? Uh, Victor, Victoria, you could not make that movie today about a woman pretending to be a man, pretending to be a woman. And of course, Diner may be the best men's comedy for men. This this lineup has never been duplicated. And Scott, I know when you go to the movies, you've, you've told me this on, on more than one occasion. You really just want to sit in the dark theater and hold hands with your wife. But when you do that, wouldn't you rather see almost any one of these movies than almost anything else you've seen in the last 10 or 15 years? I would like to see any one of those movies now. I don't think... <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't see any of them. I, I saw E.T. when it came out, and I'm pretty sure I saw Rocky Three, but probably not in the first run. I think I also saw 48 Hours, again, probably as a, in a second run $2 theater or something like that. I mean, in 1982, I was in college, um, and I didn't have a lot of money to spend on movies. I had a lot of money to spend on records. And so... <laughs> I spent all my yeah, loan money on records instead of movies. But in any case, um, you guys have got me almost excited enough to watch Wrath of Khan now because it's I, have just never, great. <laughs> it's, I have never seen that. It's so and good. I, great film. I will tell you, not only am I practically Amish, uh, but I, um, I have a tendency to cling to old things. And so now it's almost old enough for me to watch. Like when I get up every morning, the first thing I do is read a book that's about 500 years old. And so, and I just tend to think, hey, if it's stuck around for 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 years, uh, eh, maybe, it, maybe I'll give it a try now. It's proved itself. And so I'll take a look at it. Um, but no, I, I think that there are some fundamentals of storytelling that are fundamentally at odds with a political agenda. And I would say that about right or left. It doesn't matter yep. what your political agenda is. Absolutely. If you're trying to tell a story and at the same time trying to sell something, uh, then you've got to do one or the other. It's really hard to effectively tell a good story while you have an agenda because you're not willing to let go of your political imperatives in order to go places that the, that the characters would naturally go if faced with such a crisis. In fact, you're unwilling, as Bill has illustrated several times, uh, you're unwilling to create that crisis for them. You're unwilling yeah. to put them in the kind of jeopardy that's legitimate instead of trumped up. Uh, you know, when you have a character, I forget, I think it was called, uh, what was she, Captain Marvel or something like that? I was oh, like, oh my goodness. Fest. Yeah, this was like uh, this was like uh, Mel Gibson's line from that, uh, that William Wallace, where he's like, "She shoots lightning bolts out of her arse." You know, it's like <laughs> she can she can do and anything. It's boring. Like, how do you even compete with that? So yeah, there there is the hero's journey, as it was has been called, um, where you've got to start out uh, as a flawed character. You've got to face legitimate obstacles. You've got to have a goal in mind. You've got to fail on your way to achieving that goal. You have to have real jeopardy, real failure, and then you've got to somehow muster the courage from within, not a deus ex machina situation where the God comes in the machine to rescue you, but you've got to have something that changes within you that makes it possible for you to achieve that goal. And 
Some of those movies I'm aware of, including the Rocky one, um, that's what happened there, you know. And the the you know the genuine goodness of uh, the the ET character and the children around him that made it possible for them to overcome incredible odds and entire. But by the way, the best thing about that movie, those little kids overcame an entire government bureaucratic operation yes. <laughs> to achieve their goal, which is just a dream these days, isn't it? Steve, I got to add one more thing. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, please, uh, it's please, just, please, it, please, just after Scott, Scott talked about the, you know, ET and kids beating the government. That there's, it's one of the greatest political statements, and it's, and and you don't even know it's a political statement no. in Wrath of Khan. And 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 that statement is that the logic and the all throughout the episode, you you learn that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. But it turns out that the entire point of that story is no, the needs of the one outweigh the needs of the many. It is about individuals, it's about people doing individual things. It's it's an anti-collectivist movie. Its entire theory is that this one guy's life is not only worth one other guy's life, it's worth all of our lives, it's worth the life of our starship, worth the life of our crews, worth our careers, worth everything. It is it is a profoundly individualistic pro-freedom movie, and you don't even know it. If you if Brilliant. you take care of the one, the many but will your take brain care does. of itself. That's exactly yeah. right. And I would I would just add this has nothing to do with 1982, but uh, Bill got on the subject of liberty, and there is no more liberty loving movie than Smokey and the Bandit. If you haven't seen <laughs> that one in a long time, you need to see it right now. You know, I I, I left one of the uh, one of the great 1982 movies out of the big list, but I, I teased at the beginning, and it's my favorite year, and that I didn't mean to slide it when I read the big list, but that was. Probably Peter O'Toole's last truly great role. And it's a laugh out loud, family friendly movie, and everybody needs to watch it 17 times because I just told you to. Um, 1982 also had the seeds of uh, Hollywood's destruction kind of buried in there. Uh, two movies that ugh, just didn't do it for me. One was Gandhi. Seriously, screw that guy. Mm. Nobody ever watched Gandhi. <laughs> they said they watched Gandhi. They also said they watched The English Patient. Nobody watches those movies, but Gandhi won the Oscar for Best Picture out of, out of this huge, amazing lineup. Another boring yeah. snooze fest of a biopic about a pedophile. OK, great. That's 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 all we need, Hollywood. Um, and the fact that Hollywood chooses to uh, recognize the movies audiences don't really care about says tells you all you need to know about Hollywood over these last 40 years. And the other movie is Tron, which was the first real use of computer special effects mm. in a movie. And that that film was not good. It was who needs a good script? Who needs good acting? Who needs any of that stuff? We've got computer special effects. <laughs> that movie was made by Disney. And that's your right angle on that. Brought to you by the members of right, or excuse me, the members of BillWhittle.com. Jeez. I'm Steve Green for Bill Whittle and Scott Ott. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Dot com. <laughs> <laughs>